Hello and welcome to another edition of For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. Fine folks from the American Diabetes Association have joined us today in the first segment. It's Albert Whitaker, Director of Mission Delivery New England. First time on the show, so first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Let's give everybody sort of a basic uh, definition and understanding of diabetes, if you can. Okay, so diabetes, basically what it means is your pancreas is actually what produces insulin. I think the best way to say this is you have a meal and about two hours later, part of that meal is going to turn to sugar. Okay, your pancreas, what it does is it produces insulin so that those sugars can go to parts of your body that will give you energy. For someone who's living with diabetes, there's a little difficulty there because what happens is for someone, there are two types of diabetes. So there's type one, where the pancreas doesn't produce any insulin whatsoever. And you're usually born with that, right? You're born with it or you can get it like it early, early on in life. Okay. And then there's also type two diabetes where the body produces insulin, however, it's either not enough or not good enough, and eventually your body builds up a resistance. And in most cases, type two is preventable if you kind of live your life the yes, right way. it can yeah. be managed if you change um, lifestyle. Right, uh, and lifestyle meaning uh, your diet, exercise, yeah. all the well, things. Well, you, you know, I, I tend not to use exercise because people go into a panic. Right, just say active, uh, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, being be active, active or more physical activity um, definitely will help to keep those blood sugars down. So the, the thing about diabetes, especially if you're talking about type two, is it is something that you can live a pretty much a normal life with. You can control it. Yes, you can. Right. Yes, you can definitely control it with, and it depends, uh, you know, on the, uh, the progression of the illness because there are times when you may be prescribed medication. Uh, so medication coupled with that uh, diet and physical activity, um, sometimes you actually have to take insulin. So it just depends, but it can be managed. Um, I think the, the problem is that many times we wait until it's too late and we panic, by, and, we then. panic and by then we've already done some damage to our body. Um, and you know, when, when you talk about uh, advancement in the field and research, uh, what's interesting to me is not only, you know, learning about diabetes and, and treating it, but also the method in which you, would, if, if in fact you have to take insulin nowadays, it's not necessarily uh, a needle into the into the, the skin that you need to no. do, right? Well, actually, I'm living with type 2 diabetes, and uh, I do take uh, insulin, which is, uh, and basically it's in a pen form. It's great because you just adjust the amount of units that you're going to take, and you put a little pin on there, and you do what you have to do. So it doesn't uh, doesn't sound as bad as... No, it's a, not as bad, yeah. and it's, it's much more manageable. I mean, one of the problems, I think, is that people have the tendency to, there's this phobia, around needles mm. and uh, syringes. Hey, so, look, at uh, even a flu shot is a problem. Yeah, it's for a me. problem. Yeah. So, um, you know, this this way is, is is a little easier, a little more palatable, if you will. And I think the uh, the other thing that people um, observe when they talk to somebody who's uh, living with diabetes is uh, the constant blood checks all the time. Is that still a necessity of life? Well, it's really good what we call glucose fasting, which and basically what that means is that first thing in the morning if you're living with diabetes, you want to test your blood sugars. Why is that important? Because generally, if I'm idle, we want to make sure that those sugars haven't been elevated. Um, and for somebody who's living with diabetes, the American Diabetes Association says that we want that number to be somewhere between 70 and about 130. So that's a, a range. That's that, normal. That's right? n Well, that's what, for somebody living with diabetes, okay. that's the range you want. Um, if it gets to be higher than that, then we have to find out, identify what went on. Could have been the night before we decided to have that extra piece of chocolate cake at 10 o'clock at night um, or some other kind of late night snack. One of the other issues is that your, your liver actually stores sugars. And so overnight, at times, it can secrete that sugar. So that might be a reason for elevated blood sugar. So when people uh, who have diabetes talk about maybe be having low blood sugar and they kind of need something, you actually can almost see their, their temperament change a little bit when that blood sugar drops. Yes. Right. So one of the, I think one of the best symptoms, well, one of the most common symptoms of someone who's living, um, you know, who has a low blood sugar can be you become very disoriented, you can become very irritable. Um, so yes, there is a change in temperament. And, you know, the perfect example is, you know, we talk about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, um, in, we, so let's talk about carbohydrates that have a high glycemic index, which means if I take a glass of orange juice, 
my sugars are going to elevate very quickly. So in the case of a low blood sugar, the rule of thumb would be to give that individual perhaps a four ounce cup of orange juice or this is the only time the person living with diabetes can actually um, have Coca-Cola yeah, or yeah. you know some kind of really sugary soda. But because what it does is it's going to elevate your blood sugars very quickly and we want that to happen. So there's a rule of thumb that basically when somebody has a low blood sugar, you would give them the, the, the juice or, or soda, you wait 15 minutes, test your blood sugar again, if it has elevated, fine. If not, then you would repeat that cycle over again. Until it, until it normalizes. Until it normalizes. Now, is there a difference uh, when you're talking about low, high blood sugar count, whether you're talking about natural, things like fructose or something like that, versus, you know, the, the artificial? Well, there, there, so, you know, a lot of things that we eat are going to have some level of sugar in it. Right. You know, but once again, it's a, manner of ma a, man a matter of managing that carbohydrate. So for a typical plate, for example, in a nine inch plate, what we want is we want about a half a cup of carbohydrate. So that's pasta, white potato. Carbs is energy, right? Energy, because right. What's, that's, that's what's gonna actually turn into sugar and give you energy. I think the perfect example is the Boston Marathon. Mm -hmm. What do they do the night before? Ooh, man. Yeah, they yeah. do carb, you know, so it's a carb load. But they're running 26 miles the next day, and that's gonna burn up a lot of that sugar to give energy to the body. It's amazing. Runners, when you look at their body type, there's just no, not only is there no body fat, but there's no muscle yeah. in a lot of cases either because their body is just burning everything that it can possibly exactly. take. Exactly. You know? So that's why it's important that when you're eating these carbs that you, you know, it's about a quarter of a plate. A quarter of your plate should be your carb. Do you like uh, the idea that uh, restaurants and menus now really have not only the calorie count, but you can really get into and in some places, the, the nutritional value and contents of what's in a meal. Or I think in that food. that's really important because too often you go to a restaurant and you always get, you know, the supersized portion. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think that that's one of the, the attractions for going to a restaurant because in most cases you get more than you want. So to actually be able to see what the carb count is, how many calories, things of that nature are really important. It really scares you into almost not ordering a particular meal. That's right? true. Or. You know, one of the suggestions that we usually make is that if you do go to, into a restaurant and they don't have that, then what you could ask for before you even, you know, get your food is to ask for a to-go container. Take half of it, and put right. it in the to-go container, and guess what? You have a meal the next day. It's just some things that you have to do to be somewhat proactive. And it, it's um, kind of common it. sense stuff, mm -hmm. too, right? Yeah. Now, you mentioned that you have diabetes. Um, the fact that you have it, did that help you along the way of getting involved in what you do now as far as the director of the Mission Delivery New England? Well, most definitely yeah. because um, living with it and then knowing the challenges that I had when I was actually doing the outreach to actually hear those same stories, you know, kind of resonated with me. And so, you know, that was an impetus to really want to be more involved and, and be more healthy. Mi uh, d Mission Delivery New England, what is it? So it's basically what we do, or what I do, is we are actually promoting the mission of the American Diabetes Association. So that covers all that we do, whether it be our signature events, which is our tour to cure, or our walk to st step out walk to stop diabetes, um, you know, signature events that we're doing down in Fairfield County, where we have a big gala, and it's, it's ta farm to table kinds of foods, um, whether it be um, just whatever kinds of uh, initiatives that we're doing. In addition to that, we really help to kind of propel the education. So education does have power. Right. And if someone is more aware of what the consequences might be for maybe not being, and I don't like the word compliant because there are some obstacles there, but just being able to eat healthier uh, or you know, having access to quality foods, things of that nature, can really lower those blood sugars. If I know that physical activity really helps me to do that, well, if I can't get to a gym, guess what? This is nice weather these days. Maybe I can walk briskly. And there's so, many know, other, there's so many small little things you could do. When you park your car, maybe park in the lot up further away from exactly. the mall. You know, maybe uh, instead of taking the escalator, take the stairs, just little things like that. And they add up, don't they? They add up. Yeah. Because what happens is if you are able to lose 5 to 7% of your body fat, guess what? Your blood sugars go down. So we're not talking about anything, you know, overwhelming. Oh, my gracious, I have to lose all this weight. But just simple things that if you can lose that little bit of weight, that's going to lower your blood sugar. Because it really is about, uh, just like if you 
like saying that you want to diet or go on a diet is kind of like the wrong attitude to have because of what it really is is a lifestyle change. Exactly. And and with this, with having diabetes, it, if it becomes, it needs to become a lifestyle change. You almost have to not think about it. It just has to happen. Right. And I think that, you know, you bring up a very good point because baby steps have the tendency to work better than making this really, you know, uh, goal that I know is not feasible. There's no way I'm going to be able to do it. So it is, it's gradual, it's gradual lifestyle changes. I think one of the big ones, especially for me, is holidays. Mm. Families, you know, and you know, Thanksgiving, I think, is the perfect example. Someone's cooking. Someone's cooking, <laughs> yeah. and we're all eating. <laughs> but one of the things is, oh, you can't have that because you're living with diabetes. Oh, you can't have that. So what I encourage the family to do is identify two or three days a week where the family's together and we'll eat healthy. Let, let, let's get into the diabetic shoes and see what that's all about. Or, as a family, why not do some physical activity? So those are just baby things, that, baby steps that you can make, but it helps to develop that you're not only getting healthy, but your entire family is getting healthy. And by the way, even in a miserable winter like the one we had recently, you even mentioned because it was so bad, you actually dropped some pounds I dropped shoveling. Some shoveling. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not, you know, that's not for the for the faint of heart because no, you really you get to working on that. Well, it's funny because when you know I saw another snowstorm, I said, oh, I've got to go out here to shovel. Well, I guess my blood sugars will go down, and lo and behold. That's exactly what happened. You know, as a person uh, who has diabetes, but also the director of Mission Delivery New England, do you do uh, do you keep up on how research and development is going, and and are you positive with the direction and yes. how things are going? And one of the things I would say about the association is we um, have a program where we actually fund uh, up and coming researchers, and so basically it's really good to see what these these researchers are doing, and you know it's pretty spectacular uh, throughout New England where you have these researchers who are really looking at both type 2 and type 1 diabetes. We are um, almost out of time with yeah. your segment so I wanted to give you the opportunity. Is there anything you want to touch on before we wrap up your segment? Well I do want to just um, let people know that on June 7th in Kingstown, Rhode Island we'll be having our Tour de Cure which is a bike ride um, that you can definitely become a part of and then also June 14th in Durham, Connecticut there will also be a um, Tour de Cure. You can go to www.diabetes.org and localize it. Just say Connecticut Tour de Cure or Rhode Island Tour de Cure and find out more information about registering uh, for those two events. It's a fun event. It's a family event and you can really have a, a good time. But most of all, you're really helping to bring in dollars to fund research uh, toward diabetes. Albert Whitaker, Director of Mission Delivery New England for the American Diabetes Association. We learned a lot. Pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. We will take a short break and come right back. I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. Stay with us. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. The fine folks talking about the American Diabetes Association are here today. Up in this segment, Carolyn Alessi. She's the Director of Community Relations and Wellness of New England. First time on the show as well, so welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Uh, off the air, we were talking about what you were talking about, what a fantastic job Albert did in his segment. And Absolutely. How you could possibly follow up with that, right? I know. It's going to be a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, but you're going to talk about something different, and it's, it's, a, it's sort of like a set or a group of programs. Wellness uh, Lives Here, it's called, right? right? Exactly. Talk about that a little bit. Um, well, you know, the American Diabetes Association just celebrated its 75th year anniversary this year. It's been around for quite some time, and one of their strengths is around education and awareness, uh, particularly when it comes to managing the disease and preventing it. And so we've come up with an initiative called Wellness Lives Here, which is really um, a, a, an initiative that really focuses on six platforms that the ADA has um, really uh, decided were most important. And one of them is recognizing corporations and organizations as health champions, um, organizations and corporations that have a strong employee wellness program or culture. And the other is our mission engagement days, which um, we just had one May 6, um, which is a national um, get fit, don't sit um, day. And that's um, just really getting people to move, get out of their chair, move around. Um, the other is we have a great um, turnkey uh, program called Stop Diabetes at Work because we realize that a lot of um, employees are living with diabetes or 
are um, probably on that trajectory to getting diabetes. And then we also have our um, employee um, resource center where we have online resources for um, recipes, uh, nutrition counseling, et cetera. And then, of course, Albert talked about our signature events. And then the last piece of our platform is the CEO Leadership Circle, which we bring in um, CEOs or C-level executives to talk about um, the diabetes um, and the challenges and the rising healthcare costs in their corporation and what they're trying to do um, through the employee wellness program. You, you talked about uh, people that might be on a trajectory toward it. One piece of terminology that I should have talked to Albert about was pre-diabetes. Pre, mm -hmm. what is that exactly? Those are um, people who um, probably have a family history of diabetes or um, have been told by their physician that they're at risk of getting diabetes. Now, it doesn't mean that they will get it. There are some things that they can do to get off that trajectory, and that is to you know, decrease their weight by 7% and then just really doing that lifestyle change. A lot of people think that, well, once I'm told I'm pre-diabetes, I'm definitely going to get it, and it really isn't true. You know, you really do have... Um, the control to get yourself um, into a healthier place, um, even to even delay the disease in, in some cases. Do you think that diabetes, um, you, you hear about, uh, there's a lot of advocacy for, for a lot of diseases that are out there. Is there enough word of mouth? Is there enough advocacy? I mean, there can always be more, but do you hear enough about, you know, getting the word out about diabetes in general, especially compared to a lot of the other, like, for example, breast cancer, you see it everywhere. NFL's involved with it. It's on their fields. I mean, that's a big deal, you know, yeah. as far as promotion goes. Exactly. I think that um, people are aware of the disease. They understand um, once they're being told that they have or are living with diabetes. I think as an organization, we are starting to do more to really elevate the, the need to understand um, how to manage your diabetes, how to prevent it, because um, it is becoming a really big challenge in our society, in our cultures. Um, you'll, you see in um, a lot of health disparities around um, this disease management. And so for us, it's important to do segments like this where we're educating um, you know, the population around disease management and prevention, but also um, making sure that they understand that we do have resources available. I mean, the American Diabetes Association has a tremendous amount of education and awareness programs that can really get um, people to understand how to manage this. And I would imagine for all of this, the earlier the better. Now, when you saw, talk about education, you're talking about in the school system, early kids are we talking about as early as possible? Well, we, we are focused on um, children as well as we are on the aging population. Um, Albert had um, mentioned some of the programs we have, which is, you know, one of them is our senior signature series, which deals with the aging um, who are living with diabetes or who are at risk. We do recognize, just from a societal standpoint, that we do have um, a number of children who are, um, you know, on that trajectory of being obese. And when you are on that, in that type of category, you are going to be predisposed to some of these diseases like diabetes. And so we do have you know, um, opportunity to help parents and caregivers change, you know, that trajectory for their children. And then also for um, those that are aging in the workforce, you know, now corporations are seeing a number of um, their workforce aging. And so that is a big challenge um, to be able to manage that population as well. And for the companies and the corporations and for individuals, the key is prevention. Yes. You know what I mean? Prevention Again, and as management. As, prevention and management. <laughs> yes. Because, you know, maybe you can't prevent it completely, but you can certainly manage it. And one of the big things I would would imagine is you can live a pretty much normal life for the most part, yes, right? You absolutely can. I think one of the things that we're trying to do is to really collaborate with those that are focused around this disease state and to have that multi-sector collaboration. That's where I come in to really talk about, okay, who are the right people to bring to the table to really deal with this? Because particularly for type 2 diabetes, it's on the rise and it's just not coming down. And every organization, institution, um, corporation are perplexed on how do we get, um, how do we really bring these, these numbers down? Why is it on the rise? Is it just the lifestyle we are living and what we're not doing and doing and eating and not exercising and I, all that? I, it, it probably is a number of things. There's probably a number of factors. I think um, we're not, um, you know, working with those that are at risk. And so once they've been told or maybe they don't even know that they're at risk, they've already had the disease already. And so um, we're trying to um, work together um, collaboratively with partners to really figure out a meaningful way to, to really address this um, challenge in our communities. And part of it is once someone is diagnosed or told they're prediabetes, 
it's the bridging of the nutrition piece, the lifestyle change, the behavior change that we're, is really where we're falling short. Uh, you, even if you don't have diabetes, I'm sure you know somebody, obviously yes. Albert mm -hmm. does, but maybe even family members or, or people that are close to you, you all, you're going to know somebody, right? Yes, you are. And I tell you, in, you know, in my family, we do have a history of um, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So it's important to know your family history because it doesn't, your family history doesn't define you, but it, it certainly makes you much more conscientious as a person. Um, but I also have run into so many people in the work that I do who are, you know, either executives or corporations or um, our clients in a soup kitchen that are living with the disease, and they don't really say anything to anyone about it, you know, and, and sometimes even at that level. So it, it crosses all socioeconomic, um, you know, uh, background. So let's talk, let's get a little bit more specific about these uh, particular initiatives. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want to talk about? Um, I think I would love to talk about the health champion designation um, recognition that we uh, award to um, organizations, community, um, you know, in the community and also corporations that are creating that wellness culture um, for their constituents. Um, one of the things that we realize is that a lot of people spend time at work and sometimes their culture doesn't allow for them to be able to manage their disease ap appropriately. But if at the um, executive level and there's that endorsement at that top level of creating that wellness culture, we want to be able to recognize um, those types of um, companies that are really supporting their um, employees. What do they do? What can they do to be more supportive and to sort of create that culture that would be amenable to someone to be able to, to deal with their disease? Well, some of the criteria for qualifying as a health champion, whether you're an organization uh, um, in the community or in a company, is that you definitely have to first have um, healthy options for your employees, um, a, a, an ability to um, allow them to either exercise or have credit towards um, joining a gym. Yeah, a lot of places um, do that now right. because it's preventative. It's a smart thing exactly. to do. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, engagement uh, opportunities for them to get off out of their desk and walk around, walking meetings, those types of things all help to create a wellness culture. Uh, instead of serving in your meetings cookies and bagels, having healthier alternatives like fruits and vegetables um, for your employees well, and water. Well, there are so many offices that the bagels come yes. in or the donuts <laughs> come in, at least on a weekly basis, you know. And again, I, I would imagine one of the worst things for your body is to just sit at a desk all day. It is. Some people just have to get up and walk around. You know, maybe you, you go to lunch and that's about it. If you do a typical eight-hour day, mm -hmm. think about that's a third of your day that you're just sitting down, you know, right. if you have that kind of a job too. Exactly. What else? Um, the other one is uh, really just bringing um, the senior leaders to the table. Um, we, we are going to be actually pulling together a, um, a panel discussion with, um, you know, CEOs that have exemplified this particular culture in their organization and understanding what they're doing. And then also really posing the question, do these um, employee wellness programs really drive down the healthcare costs? What are the things that um, are not that they're not seeing um, as a result of the investment that they're making and what do they need to do more of and sometimes it's just a matter of you know tra translating that online um, portal into something that employees can actually engage in physically you know and that's where the American Diabetes Association comes in play we we do offer lunch and learns we do um, talk about ways where you can get your employees more engaged physically um, rather than them going to an online portal when they are being told by their doctor that they have, you know, that triggering point of, oh, you're at risk. I can't see how uh, having these, you know, healthy wellness, you know, initiatives in the workplace can't do anything but be a healthy option and a smart thing. You can actually, you can take diabetes out of the equation. Uh, it's got to save money, the company, by providing gym memberships, even if it's a $10 a month thing, you're creating, now granted the employees actually have to go to the gym and use it, mm -hmm. uh, but you're creating healthier employees. They're probably going to be out sick less. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all, it seems like it's a good thing, you it, know? It is. It definitely is. I think one of the, the, the barriers that I, I want to see being able to be broken down is if you have an organization that is running lean, you know, where you, you're, you're just not able to staff up and so your um, employees are pretty much stuck behind the desk on the computer a lot, is to really find innovative ways to uh, get them moving, get them being able to um, go to the gym or feel that they have permission to do those things. Or just take a walk um, outside. Or take a walk, exactly. Um, and that's what I mean by it's not just the employee wellness program, it's the culture that you're cultivating 
in your organization. The lifestyle. Is really the lifestyle change. Yeah. Right. And that's what we really think will um, help support those living with diabetes and also get those who are predisposed to get them off that trajectory. All this, I'm sure, is on the website for people to go and learn more. What is the yes. website? The website for the Wellness Lives Here is www.wellnesslivesherein, it's all one word, .org. And that is um, part of the diabetes.org website. And you can also um, look for resources on our website as well around education and um, nutrition. Carolyn Alessi is the Director of Community Relations and Wellness for New England. Uh, again, we learned a lot today, a lot about diabetes and, and really just lifestyle changes that we can all make to be better people, healthier people. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having us. You can see this show and many others on our YouTube site. Until next time, I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. Take care.